Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Has anybody here heard the voice of the Lord lately? God speaking in your life? Did you hear him audibly in your ears last night as you laid down to go to sleep? Well, the question remains for every human heart, how do we better connect with God? And how do we hear what he's trying to say to us? Because indeed he's trying to speak to us. The very first verse that was read uh, from the book of Hebrews from the lectern a few moments ago said that long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, by Jesus. And indeed that was the case at the time of the apostolic fathers and the writing of the scriptures in those early centuries. But it's also the case today that Jesus still speaks to us through the wonderful, marvelous, perfect, divine agency of the Holy Spirit of God. The Pentecostal event brought about a spirit into this world from God that speaks to our hearts, that enlivens us and lifts us. And we still hear from the Lord, but not always. Not everybody hears as you might wish to hear. I've never audibly heard a voice of God. I never heard the clouds break open and the thunderous shout come through, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, as Jesus heard and as others heard around him that day by the River Jordan. But I've not heard that. But I have to remind you of something that I repeat a lot in my sermons so that you'll get it into your heart, that God is continually in your life every moment. He knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. He knows you're going out, you're coming in, you're lying down, you're rising up. He knows everything about you because he adores you and he watches over you. And what I say is that if you pick up God's messages to you ten times a day, you're still missing it by one thousand and more. He speaks moment by moment if only you would hear him. It's like a, a mother watching over her infant toddler as the baby bounces around to make sure the baby doesn't fall down a flight of stairs or bump into a table. God is watching you and watching me with that kind of loving attentiveness. He cares that much. Isn't that marvelous? You are truly a child of God. And seeing that requires special eyes. Seeing the divine behind the ordinary requires special looking and special listening. And if you ask, well, how do I accomplish that? The answer is in the gospel. Jesus speaks it to us. When he speaks that you have to be childlike in order to be entering the kingdom of heaven, what he means is that being like a child, being childlike, is a very important part of our humility, our walk, and being the nature of who we are made in the image of God. Because before the sermon's over, I'm going to submit to you that God himself is childlike as the world might define it. And Jesus speaks to us in Mark 10. And the Gospel writer tells this story. He says, People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not stop them. Here comes the good part. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blesses them. And I've come to realize in my own walk, studying that passage about children entering the kingdom of God, that the person most in God's image is most like that when they are both adult and child at the same time. We're made in God's image, and he's calling us to be childlike. I guess that means he must be, in his essence, childlike as well. And when I am truly a mature Christian person, living according to the principles and teachings of Jesus, and living as a good disciple of his, I am at the same time living with one foot in the playground, if you will, in the playground of the kingdom, being a child of God and knowing what that is. The trick is to be a mature Christian and to be a child at heart at the same time, at one and the same time. And Jesus talks to us about that. Be childlike. Not childish, but childlike. Big difference between the two. What is that, though, to be childlike? What does that mean to be childlike? Because we can run to fanciful thoughts of what it might be. Well, what is a child? A child is someone who accepts truth and wonder, empty-handed, open-handed, with an open heart, purely, trustingly, a child will receive what a parent gives the child, or for that matter, receive what God offers the child. Because if you're someone like my wife, Patty, 
Patty, when she was three years old, heard the name of Jesus and embraced him and just loved him and has had a pure heart ever since. If you're someone like me, you heard it and it registered, but then you walked away and you had to be hit over the head with a two-by-four before you finally got the idea that God is real and you would come back because of your willfulness. Well, a child in his perfect condition will trust, will believe, will have faith. Faith without demanding worldly proof. Now hold on to your hats here for a moment, because I'm not saying what you think I'm saying. People will demand scientific evidence of God before they believe. Well, I'll believe if this happens, or if that happens, or if the skies open up and it snows in July, then I'll believe, or something silly like that. We try to use human wisdom, human learning, and human-derived science, we think, to prove God or not prove God. God can't be because he's not logical under human thinking. Human thinking is inferior. It's beneath God. And for that matter, God, so to speak, invented it. He created it. All thinking, all science, all academics are under him because he created everything of which we study. So nothing can be overarching above him and shine a light upon him. Instead, he shines light through those disciplines, and through those disciplines shows his glory by his revelation to the world. Let's face it, if God had not revealed himself in various ways in the Old Testament, if he had not revealed himself in the scriptures, if he had not revealed himself in his son Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have had a clue as to who he was. For no science, history, learning, anthropology, or anything else is going to show who God is, but God works through those things to you and me so that we might know who he is. But we have more problems than just that. More problems than just the academic gripping of God. We have the problem that we cannot quickly go to God without such proof. We will not leap without looking. We don't leap until it looks safe. And he's asking us to come to him in faith and let him work on us. And why is it? Why are we so slow on the draw to trust? Why wouldn't we believe in him more readily? Why do we reserve our holding and hold back our belief in God? I think it's because we've been hurt. When you're a small child and you're in your childlike ways, which older cousin, brother, sister, friend, next door neighbor, kid at school made you feel badly by mocking you for your childlike belief? I remember the first time I was mocked for believing in Santa Claus and how silly and stupid I was made to feel, just to give you a simple example. We belittle one another, and what happens is we become broken in that, tainted, hurt, twisted, contorted. We've been fooled, we feel. We've been burned and ripped off, and we feel so embarrassed that, oh, how can I be so immature? How can I be so childlike? That heavenly childlike expectation is replaced by so-called worldly maturity, which is inferior all the way. And that's why God is calling us through Jesus back to a childlike nature. You may say that the world has ruined us for God by making us only believe in him after certain things are evidenced to us in an apologetic way. But the truth is that though the world will attempt to knock us off stride and ruin us, he comes flooding back to us. Jesus comes to redeem it and comes back to say, no, when you do trust me, it all works out wonderfully. It will be fine. Jesus put children in the midst of his apostles and his disciples. Today he embraces one in the gospel. I think he did that so they could see what it looks like and say, here's what I'm telling you to be like when you deal with the kingdom of God. Set aside all your pretend knowledge, your pretend stature, that you think you're somebody because you know a few things, or you've experienced a few things. It doesn't come that way. In fact, this word adult is an odd word. We give it a positive spin. Act like an adult. Be more adult. Oh, he's such an adult. She's such an adult. The word adult, though, is kind of negative when you think about it. It comes from the same root word, of course, as adulterated. They're both the same words in one form or another. And adulterated is not a good thing. We are adult, you and me, who are adults in this room. If you're a child, you're on your way. But we're adult because we've been adulterated. And children today are being adulterated at a young age. They turn on televisions, they see things in their life, the way the people act around them, makes them get older young. They lose their innocence. They lose their childhood very young. I thought I lost it young, running the streets as, a, as an adolescent. But kids lose it today even younger than I did in my own experience. Adulterated. Like here's a simple definition, a dictionary definition. To be adulterated is to be corrupted, debased, to be made impure by the addition of a foreign or inferior substance or element. You get that? We're corrupted.
corrupted, we're debased, we're made impure because something inferior, something foreign is being put into us or into a, a substance, a chemical formula, the food you buy in the supermarket. Well, God made me pure, and he made you to be pure too. He made us in his image, and he made us to be the way he is, but the world has added all these corrupted impurities to the point now where I am an adult. I am adulterated. Congratulations. And you're adulthood, you have reached a certain status, there are certain rites of passages, but the bad news is you've stepped away a little bit from the image of God. You've stepped away a little bit from being childlike, the way Jesus has called us to be in these scriptures today. And we do this. We become adulterated and jaded as people. So when he says, accept the kingdom of God with an open heart and an open hand, we say, I can't, Lord. I'm too jaded. I'm too dulled. Too cynical, suspicious, unbelieving, and doubtful. I'm too untrusting, cautious, leery, skeptical. I just can't be that way because I've been burned. I'm afraid, Lord, I'm afraid that the world will mock me and laugh at me. Or even if I'm not afraid, I'm just so damaged and wounded, because when I was a child, people laughed at me for believing in you, or for believing things in general. I was brought up in the world to have its wisdom and not yours, so that I can only believe you when I see you. Seeing is believing, and not the other way around, because indeed the scriptures say we don't have our, our faith in God by seeing, that seeing comes after believing. Believing precedes our, our seeing. Faith comes first, then we see. We don't see and then find faith. We're afraid of those things. We're afraid of being foolish. People will call me a fanatic. I'll be silly, naive, unsophisticated, gullible, sucker, duped, or ignorant, and I'm afraid of that. But God says to us, you don't have to be that way. Come to me in a childlike manner. Approach my kingdom with the open heart of a child, with your arms open to receive me. I will never do that to you, because I myself am pure-hearted. I myself might be childlike. God will never trick you, deceive you, bamboozle you, hoodwink you, dupe, victimize, play you for a fool, or pull the rug out from under you. I'm at Dean the thesaurus now. Uh, he, will, he will never pull the wool over your eyes, he'll never take you for a ride, and he'll never put one over on you. He's real, he's genuine, he's authentic, he's unfailing, he's bona fide. He is everything the Bible says he is, and you can trust him. Trust him completely. Be a child in his midst, and you will be safe. G.K. Chesterton was an English writer, lay theologian, poet, philosopher. He was a literary critic, he was an art critic, an orator. He was a Renaissance man, I guess, in the late 19, 1800s and early 1900s. And he wrote something that I think is marvelous. That's why I'm going to read it to you today. He wrote that being childlike at heart is being like God himself. I think he's proffering, and I agree with him, that God himself is childlike. And listen to his case for it, as Chesterton writes. He says, a child will kick his legs rhythmically because he has an excess of life. Not an absence of life, but an excess. Because children have a bounding vitality. Because they are in spirit fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated. They want things unchanged. Children always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again and again and again until he's nearly dead. <laughs> I get that. You see, grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt a monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt a monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be an automatic necessity that makes all the daisies alike. It may just be that God makes every da daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them, saying again, do it again and do it again. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned, you and I, and we have grown old, and our father is younger than we are. That God is younger than me that his childlike delight in the world and the things he's made, and his very children himself, you and me, is such that he has this childlike, loving, wonderful heart. He loves me. He pays attention to me. And we have the fifth verse of the eighth psalm, which we had today, which was repeated in our Hebrews reading. In our Hebrews reading, it was so important, it came out again. And in the middle of the Hebrews reading, it says that, What is man, Lord, that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? I think about that all the time. Lord, why do you pay attention to me? I'm not worth it. 
Why do you watch over me, the numbers of the hairs of my head and all? But he does, because he loves me. This eighth psalm is something I've got to tell you about, because it's really important in my life. It is something that came into my life and changed me. Uh, one night, in the middle of the night, in 1989, I woke up in a cold sweat, sitting up straight in my bed, like out of a nightmare like you would, and the words were blaring in my ears, read the eighth psalm. This psalm that we chanted today, you can look it up in the prayer book if you need it later on, this eighth psalm. I immediately got out of bed. I didn't lay there and think what's going on. It was so alarming, so shocking, so overwhelming. I got out of bed and went in the living room, and I began reading the eighth psalm over and over again. And there it was, and it said, you know, O oh Lord, our oh Lord, how excellent or exalted is your name in all the earth. Different versions say governor, it says different things. But it was this song about God creating the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the seas, about the planets and their courses. And I'm saying, why am I supposed to read this? What's the meaning here? Am I supposed to be a zoologist? Am I supposed to be a farmer or an ecologist? Why am I asked to read this? Two days later, my children are in the Presbyterian church at a children's ministry thing. They're having this closing exercise. So Patty and I go. Now Patty knows what's going on. As soon as she woke up that morning, after my 3.30 wake-up call that day, I told her all about it. The children read the 8th Psalm two days later. Two or three days after that, I go as a guest to a Baptist church where my friend is preaching, and they read the 8th Psalm. A couple of weeks after that, I go to my Episcopal church. It shows up in the lectionary. They read the 8th Psalm. And it comes to me again and again, and it won't go away. And I start asking older wives or Christian people in my midst, what could this possibly mean? And I'm walking around for months and then a year and two years, and the eighth psalm keeps visiting me. It gets to the point where I think I'm to be a priest, and I go to the commission on ministry for a whole weekend at a retreat. Bishop Salmon is there, the canon of the ordinary, several priests, all these lay people on the commission on ministry for two or three days. Patty's with me. And after the first night, they say, we're going to have worship in the morning. And they start handing out the assignments. Somebody's going to read the Gospel, somebody's going to read the Psalms, somebody's going to read the Epistles, somebody's going to read the Old Testament lesson. Guess what I get? The eighth Psalm. I mean, first of all, there were 14 people there, and only four out of 14 get to read anything. And then if you get to read something, there's a one in three or four chance that I get to read the Psalm. And then when I get the Psalm, there's 150 of those. So if you multiply it out and do all the arithmetic, the odds are about one in 3,000 that I'm going to get the eighth Psalm. At that moment, I was given the eighth psalm. I still have the piece of paper that they handed me. It's in the office here in my Bible. I'll show it to you. I've saved it all these years. And I said, stop right there. And Patty said, stop. Patty started going to tears. And we're there. there was something going on here. We explained the whole story to Bishop Sam and it took 15 or 20 people there. And everybody's silent after they hear my story. And the canon of the ordinary says, if I were you, I'd be reading the eighth psalm. I said, I know. I've been reading the eighth psalm. That's why I'm talking to you, you genius. I've been reading it. This guy, Mike Malone, is my dear friend. He preached at my ordination. So it goes on from there. Three years later or so, I'm to be ordained a priest. I go to the cathedral in Charleston where the standing committee is meeting to give me the final approval. Fifteen minutes after the standing committee meeting, our convention begins as a diocese. They did the meeting around the convention. And there's huge worship to go on. They approve me. I come out of the room. All the priests there to greet me. I knew most of them. They loved me. One of the priests named Chuck Owens was wearing this stole, and he took it off his head, turned it around, put it on me, reaches over and kisses me on the cheek to say, now you're going to be one of us. We go in there. We start worshiping. Guess what song they're singing an hour after that? What song do you think it is? No, it was the 33rd. It was the 33rd song. But that's what was in the bulletin. But as we began worship, Dean William McKeechee, the dean of the cathedral, who's a dear friend of some people in this church, stood up for the congregation and said, we have a combined mix of choirs for this convention from all over the diocese. The song is going to be changed. We will be singing the eighth song this evening. What was going on there in childlike fashion, hearing the voice of God, where I just said, Hebrew says, hear the voice of God. Jesus says, be childlike, is this. There was nothing particularly in the text for the 8th Psalm for me. The 8th Psalm was God's way of coming from behind the ordinary with the divine to me, to tell me that he wanted me perhaps to be his priest. He was giving me his affirmation, his wink of the eye, and every time I bumped into it, he would say, here it is, here it is, here it is, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. On the night he called me, all along the way in churches, 
at the Commission on Ministry the night I was approved for, approved for ordination. And you can rest assured, at my ordination service, we said the eighth psalm. I made sure it was put in there. We did that. But God was giving me the green light, the reassurance, the wink, the thumbs up, the affirmation, the validation, the approval that I want you to do this. So what does that mean for you? Is it just a silly story, or a personal self-reference and some uh, egocentric explanation for me? Not a bit. I'm trying to show you. I, I tried to be childlike and open to understand what God was saying in that episode for me. You have the same things in your life. We all do. He's speaking to us. And just as it says in Hebrews, in these last days he is speaking to us through his Son, and now even his Holy Spirit. But those who will hear from the kingdom are the same who enter the kingdom. Those who have childlike hearts and childlike minds and childlike spirits. For indeed I believe the Lord himself is childlike in that way. Thanks be to God for the Lord who loves us in that way. Amen. Let us stand. Let's our faith together.